You know, a lot of people ask why I even bother to make models anymore when I have uh, the computer. And for me, it's part of my design process. It's, um, it's like visual sketching. It's like three-dimensional sketching. So it's also one of the reasons why I wanted to be an architect in the first place. So I'd, I'll probably never give it up. I know some people have uh, great luck modeling in the computer. I just find I'm on the computer all the time. So this is just a chance to step away and think differently. The other thing about models, making models, is clients absolutely love them. So it's great to be able to pick them up and spin them around and look inside of them. There's this really cool thing that happens when you've left something sort of open to interpretation and uh, it's not so hard and fast and rigid. I just find working at the computer forces you to make decisions maybe too early maybe at a time when you're not quite ready to make those decisions. So for me, just keeping it loose like this is perfect. So one of the things I was looking forward to most when I went to architecture school was sort of model making classes. And when I got to school, I was a little disappointed that they, there actually weren't any model making classes, that they were expecting you to teach yourself. And so one of the first things I did was head to the library and start sort of researching different modeling styles, sort of people to emulate, people to copy. So some of my early heroes were people like Wes Jones. I think at the time he was with Fow Jones, uh, but he would make these very detailed mechanistic sort of machines for living. Uh, there was Neil Denari and his Urban Monastery. That was kind of a, that was a seminal work that I, I looked at that and I thought, wow, I like this is exactly what I'm interested in. Like I love the style, the mix of, sort of open spaces, the detail, and then the sort of carved spaces. And then the last one, the last avatar here is uh, Morphosis or Morphosis, however you say that. And these guys were building these incredibly detailed models. They were open-ended in a way. They were suggestive of sort of doors and windows and structure and material, uh, but they were, they were left room for interpretation. And so I kind of adopted this style um, as part of my own. I sort of emulated it, copied it, and then over time with practice, it sort of became my own thing. Um, but one of the things that the commonalities that all of them shared was that they were using planes to create space. They weren't building sort of masses. And you'll see this often for sort of really large scale work, like say a skyscraper or urban, you know, a model of a city. There are just forms that are blocked out. But this doesn't say much about what the architecture actually is. It doesn't talk about openings. It doesn't really talk about material in any real way. You know, this thing could be 100 feet tall um, or it could be five feet tall. Um, so this is less appealing to me as a modeling style. Once we start transitioning into defining space and showing how you know a surface may feel to be near it, so if this bottom layer, you can picture this bottom layer being all glazed, for example, that says a very different thing about what this is. And then this upper area might be slate shingles or it might be metal. Um, so once you start rendering this space and depth and shadow into a model, it becomes much more appealing. And that is the modeling style that we're gonna be talking about today. And that's the style that's sort of represented here. The story of this model starts with the materials, and I think you're best to keep it to a minimal material palette when you're just getting started. I think overall, a monochromatic model, uh, one that has some browns and grays in it, perfect for when you're just starting. Now you can learn to add in different representative materials as you get more skilled at doing this, but I would say keep a limited material palette when you're just getting started. So we have, the bulk of the materials are basswood. I like basswood because it paints easily, cuts easily, doesn't dull your tools, and it's got a nice rigidity. When you paint it, it doesn't tend to curl like chipboard does. It's more expensive than chipboard or cardboard. I like this because I can create a presentation model for my clients and not have to do much with it. Now, as an accent material, I've got this mahogany sheet. These are both 16th of an inch, and you can get this in various strips and sizes columns, and we'll talk about structure in a minute. But these are nice materials to work with. They're finished materials. You don't have to do a lot to them. 
We also have the model base here. If you have a site that has a lot of topography change, um, you're gonna wanna use something like cork, and I prefer the cork underlayment, which goes under like a floor, for example. It's a lot cheaper than buying modeling cork, and you can get large rolls for very little money. Uh, you might be using corrugated cardboard or chipboard to make your contour lines on your sloping site model. For this particular one, we've got some limestone tile samples, and I got these from Stone Source, and I've just cut them up with a tile saw into these sort of linear bar pieces. I have done a, a video previously about model bases and I'll link that up in the cards so you get a sense for uh, why a model base is important. But it's nice to have a plinth that the building sits on. You wanna be thinking about how it meets the ground plane. Is the building sort of burrowed into it? Is it sitting above it and there's columns that are marching down on it? Is the slight site sloping? The building has a relationship to the site and it's important that your model address that in some real way. So we've talked about our site here. I have a little sort of uh, site wall gesture here and this is just by taking a piece of tile and turning it on its side. So that fits in here. Uh, the last couple of things I want to talk about are, you know, I've got some acrylic samples. They're nice sort of pieces for using uh, as compositional elements. In this particular model, I have this little sandblasted piece of acrylic that I'm using as a water feature element. So it's nice to think about sort of site elements in here. I've went out and bought a coir mat from Home Depot and I've just cut that up. It's got a vinyl backing to it and you can use this to show vegetation on the site. You can also use it for a green roof element. And so these are just nice to have and fairly inexpensive. Uh, last material element we'll talk about, and I've talked about this before. If you buy a pack of guitar strings, you get a range of different wire gauges and it's cheaper than going to the model store and buying their strip wire or piano wire, something like that. This I use for marking um, swinging doors. I use it for barn doors. Another great thing that you can do with this is uh, bend it up and sort of indicate circulation paths or stairways, handrails, things like that. Um, so this is a nice thing to have. I use this on almost every model that I build. If you think about the construction sequence and how you'd actually construct a real piece of architecture, you'll start answering the question on what you need to model. Here we have the site, and this is a relatively flat site, so I'm just using these two limestone tile pieces as a base, and I have this site wall that I've inserted in between the two of them. And then what we need next is a foundation for the building. Now, this doesn't have to be completely representative of what the foundation is. You know, this is not gonna be sitting on beams directly on the site, but the idea is that it lifts the building off the site. So from there, we wanna start thinking about the structure. Here I'm showing columns, and again, it could be bearing walls, it could be columns, it could be a hybrid of the two. Now, obviously we have walls, we have doors and windows, we have roof planes, we have finishes, we have equipment. Now, you don't necessarily have to model all of these pieces, but you know, the ones that you choose to model, they can actually give you sort of design inspirations. And you, know, you don't have to model a, a walkway on the site, but once you do, it starts suggesting how you might move between the structures, how you know, we're slipping these planes by each other, and actually you may move like this, or you may use another structure to modulate that. I would say rather than treating these as a strict checklist of things that you actually need to include in a model, I would use them as inspiration. If a mechanical system is going to be inspire the form of the building, it's an important part of the structure, plan to build a model of it. You know, if vegetation is really impacting how you're gonna move in and around the site, you should probably model it. Cabinetry, that's another system that you wanna start thinking about and how, how you model it and how it might inform how you enter a building or how you move through it or how it actually connects to the site. Coming up in part two, we'll look at the detailed techniques for cutting, gluing, and making everything you see here in this model.